talk about forward modeling. Uh, Justin will talk about forward modeling of SAR backscatter during like, uh, lake ice melt conditions using SMART model. Justin, over to you. Justin, you're muted. Justin, you're muted. I apologize. I've been teaching no, I... in person, so I'm not used to unmuting myself anymore. <laughs> um, thank you, Homa. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. My name is Justin Murphy. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Waterloo. Today, I'll be presenting uh, one of the last steps of my PhD, which is on the four modeling of SAR backscatter during lake ice melt conditions using. Oh, Am I controlling that? Um, using SMRT. Uh, I'd just like to thank all my co-authors um, from both Canada, France, and Finland on this work. So I think today you're going to hear a lot about the importance of lake ice, but I'm going to start us off today with just some quick summary points. Lake ice provides important ecological services across the Northern Hemisphere, ranging from the economy, tourism and mining, transportation and cultural. Additionally, lake ice cover and lake ice thickness are two thematic variables uh, as part of the essential climate variables. Um, however, in-situ monitoring of lake ice has declined with satellite uh, observations becoming increasingly important over the last two decades. In regards to actually understanding lake ice, in particular the interaction with active microwave, um, modeling in terms of either numerical or through radio transfer models, provides a valuable opportunity for understanding how changes in lake ice properties impact microwave response to lake ice through sensitivity experiments. This has become even more important in recent years with changes in our understanding of uh, scattering mechanisms for lake ice. So we've changed from a double bounce uh, primarily mechanism towards something of a single bounce, focusing on roughness of the uh, ice water interface. And while modeling studies generally agree with satellite observations, there are limitations to some of these past approaches and no consistent approach for the modeling of lake ice uh, in terms of the microwave side has been proposed. And so one of the reasons that you hear so much of a, us talking about SMRT, the snow microwave rate of transfer modeling, is because it presents a common approach. Um, the Python library allows us to access uh, numerous electromagnetic models, microstructure models, uh, as well as incorporating both snow and ice layers. And all these start to address some of the limitations we've seen in past modeling. And so to date with SMRT, We've done fairly extensive explorations on the impact of different properties. So we've explored ice thickness, uh, the roughness of different interfaces, both the uh, root mean square height as well as the correlation length. So the vertical and horizontal displacements and roughness. Uh, and we've also been able to reproduce backscatter throughout an ice season uh, using both field data and output from the Canadian Lake Ice Model, CLIMO. And we've actually integrated CLIMO with SMRT uh, that allows us to bring simulations more in line with reality compared to past observations that have used synthetic values for things such as temperature um, or ice layers. However, largely within the modeling that's been done, wet conditions, uh, whether that's late season during melt onset and breakup, or those during midwinter uh, freeze thaw events that we see commonly in mid-latitudes, these events have been largely ignored in the modeling work. And so the overarching goal of this particular research project is to explore these events using SMRT and some of the more recent updates to the model that include uh, addressing things such as uh, mixed mixed layers where we have uh, more water content uh, than what was than what was possible in the model beforehand. And so for this experiment, we're looking at uh, a field data collected uh, on Lake Oliarvi uh, from FMI. They did a fairly extensive study of the lake uh, in 2021. 
collecting numerous, uh, quite a lot of data on snow pits, ice stratigraphy, and something we don't typically see on lake ice cover is the snow microstructure. Uh, and so they did a very extensive survey and the data is perfect for parametrizing SMRT. There was eight study sites in total, which you can see on the um, figure on the left-hand side. Uh, so we've got 002 all the way to 008 in the northern part of the lake there. Uh, red circles were data collected on January 29th, January 30th, yellow March 1st, March 2nd, and green on the 25th and 26th. And on the right hand, uh, hand side of the slide, uh, you can see an evolution of backscatter from, from Sentinel-1. And this was this is uh, uh, generated using 135 Sentinel-1 images, both HH and VV. Uh, the blue is the HH and the orange is the VV. And so there were three observation periods, ILP1, ILP2, and ILP3. ILP1 is our dry conditions. You can see that that relates to colder temperatures, where ILP2 snow was slightly wet. And then ILP3, we saw slush layers forming. And so we've got three nice conditions to represent. And we can represent all three of those conditions in SMRT. And so within SMRT, we're working with the IBA electromagnetic model. For interface roughness layers, we're using the int integral equation model, um, IEM. This is good for small scale roughness like we see in lake ice. And our microstructures parameterize using the sticky hard spheres. Uh, you can also see collections of kind of the constant parameters. For snow, we're generally looking at a roughness of a millimeter and looking at volumetric water content between zero and 20%. And then for the ice parameters, we're looking at generally a small layer of snow ice on top, as you can see on the right side uh, of the breakdown of our different ice columns, an ice water interface with a millimeter, uh, with a roughness of about a millimeter. Other properties we did vary in the experiments, and so we can take a look at those. And so these are the experiments under dry snow conditions. And so what you can see here is that we've kept everything constant and, and adjusted that roughness at the ice water interface. Um, pretty much depending on, no matter if you have snow ice or no snow ice, as seen here with uh, site six and site five, uh, um, we see that the dominant one here is that ice water interface. And so as we increase towards 2.5 millimeters, a fairly rough ice water interface, backscatter increases. And based on kind of the backscatter observed from both of these sites, uh, our optimal roughness and likely the roughness of the ice water interface is around this 1 to 1.25 millimeter range. As we move into wet snow conditions, and so during IOP2, uh, this is when we had a little bit of wet snow on top of the ice. Uh, something that may not surprise many of you that are familiar with radar is that the dominant interface starts to become the top of the snowpack. And so the top layer of that wet snow uh, is where backscatter is being controlled. And so as you can see through these simulations here, um, as we increase that volumetric water content with the different layers of roughness, we also see increases in backscatter. And so with wetter, with wetter snow, we're seeing more backscatter return. And then this is also increasing as the roughness of that uh, snow surface increases. And we tested the different correlation lengths as well to see the differences there. Um, and you can see that generally for our VV polarized data, uh, the representation is fairly good. Um, however, HH is underestimated by uh, SMRT. And, and, that, and that was a theme that we saw throughout the data so far. And, this, and, the, and so in these experiments, um, we wanted to explore whether or not the other interfaces also had a role or if it was primarily that top of the snow. And so these three experiments were run where the ice surface, so the top of the ice column, had an RMSH, so that root mean square height of one millimeter, two millimeters, and three millimeters. And what we see an impact at the start here, where volumetric water content is zero as expected, as soon as we start to introduce that small amount of water into the snowpack, immediately both of our, all of our observations uh, come together uh, and increase consistently. And so again, it's that top of the snowpack that's controlling the backscatter. For these experiments, we wanted to explore how wet snow conditions at different layers impact what we're seeing. And so we were lucky that when 
FMI was out collecting the data. On March 1st, the snowpack was wet at the top of the snow, uh, was the, the wetness was at the top of the snowpack. And on March 2nd, it was the wetness had shrunk. And so rather than being at the top, we now had it in the lower uh, layers of the snowpack. And so what we can see is that there's a, there's a little bit of a difference between the two, um, but again, still it's that roughness at the top of that wet layer. And so in this case, uh, for March 1st, it's roughness at the top of the snowpack. And then for March 2nd, it's roughness between the dry and wet snow layer. Again, HH pole is a little bit underestimated compared to the VV. Um, however, we do see this similar results. Um, and again, uh, for the small rectangles on the left side of the plots, we see that even that small addition of water starts to drop the backscatter, however, it increases uh, due to that roughness value. Lastly, we looked at saturated layers. And so this is a small layer, four centimeter layer at the top of the ice. So between the snow and the ice representing a slush layer. The water fractional volume here is 65%. So lots of water and a little bit of ice. And what we see here is much higher backscatter values. And this is likely due to the higher dielectric constant uh, between the different layers here. And so that very high dielectric value for uh, this slush layer combined with roughness at the top of it uh, leads to these much higher backscatter uh, and likely could explain some melt we see at the start uh, during those melt freeze seasons if we have that formation of slush. And this is actually supported in past aerial observations. So overall, these are the first experiments using SMRT to model wet conditions over a lake ice column. Very important again for those slushing conditions and those uh, freeze melt events that occur uh, in the midwinter, something that we're seeing more of at Arctic latitudes, but common in the mid latitudes. Simulations demonstrate that when there's a melt event, the dominant interface becomes the top of the wet snow path, where there's the largest dielectric constant uh, and, and contrast. And this is both for those saturated and just semi-wet layers. And so in future simulations and moving forward with this, uh, we're gonna work more closely to tie uh, what we're seeing in the modeling to the events that we see in the field data. So thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions if we've got a little bit of time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justin. Um, we do have time for questions. If you have questions, please uh, raise your hand or uh, put it in the chat. Um, Justin, I'm wondering, uh, what is the maximum um, ice thickness uh, for this lake? Um, you so, like an average. So here we're looking, I was about 50 centimeters or so. Um, so I can just go back to this slide here. So this is, um, this was for the site uh, 005 that I focused on for these simulations. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you're reaching about 50 centimeters for this lake. Um, quite a, uh, one of the reasons I focused on this particular site was because it did have that little bit of extra snow ice on it. Um, and it was more consistent compared to some of the other sites as well, in terms of the thickness that we saw. When you say 50 centimeter, you're referring to white. The whole, the whole ice column. The whole ice? Yeah, 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 the whole ice, yeah. Okay, it's, uh, I expected to have more <laughs> in that, yeah. that group, but yeah. Interesting, very interesting. Um, Laura Brown, do you have a question? Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, Justin. I was just wondering, when you're modeling the bottom uh, the ice water interface, that value you found, that optimal value, 1 to 1.25, mm -hmm. I think you said? Yeah. Did you find it that it changes over the, or can you at all in your model change that over the season with the ice growth? Or is uh, is that something you've looked at at all? Yeah, so in in some of the work that we've been doing for the dry conditions, um, what we've found is that at the start of the ice season, um, the optimal value tends to be a lot lower. And then as the ice grows, it gets higher. Um, and so kind of mid-season for the deeper lakes, we found one millimeter tends to be the best value. Um, but for shallower lakes, we found that a much higher value um, is works better in the modeling. Um, and that typically aligns with where we have 
those dense tubular bubble layers, which is kind of a nice thing to see. Oh, great. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I, I see one more question. Tate, please go ahead. Hi, Justin. Uh, very intriguing talk. Uh, really cool work. Um, and just kind of to, to follow along with the last question, I guess, from I'm more of an observational snow scientist. And um, in my experience, you know, one millimeter of surface roughness is not really physical where we kind of expect maybe 10 to 25 centimeters for some uh, sastrugi on, on snow surfaces. So I, I guess maybe I'd be asking you to help, uh, help me understand what the relationship between your modeled RMS heights are and, and how they're uh, optimal compared to like what our field-based experience is of snow surface roughness maybe. Yeah, so um, this was going into, so one of, our, one of our biggest challenges is getting the correct roughness values. Um, for lake ice in particular, we don't have good measurements. Um, this is working off of more of a small scale considerations rather than large scale. Um, and from some, from looking through the literature, and I focused a lot on sea ice, what I saw from the small scale was that these one millimeter snow roughness values um, with a one centimeter correlation length on the small scale um, tended to be what was reported. And so that's what I was going with. Um, so I'm not sure how that, I don't know if you're looking at larger scale observations for roughness or on the small scale. Um, but this, these were kind of the values that I found that aligned with past observations um, for our arm height, um, rather than going on something larger where we'd have to use geometrical optics. And so trying to stick with the IEM instead. So, okay, so it's a modeling consideration. So you'd have to basically change your roughness model to consider larger surface roughness. Yeah, so if we were, if we want to look at roughness values of, you know, 25 centimeters plus over a large scale, then we would switch to geometrical optics solution rather than using IEM that's for small scale roughness. Um, and so that's part of the consideration there is that we can't go that high with IEM just because of the restrictions. Um, actually five millimeters was kind of the max we could do, so. Okay, and I assume that's a, like a wavelength consideration yeah. for this type of radar, yeah. Yeah, yeah for okay. wave number, yeah. Okay, hey, thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, okay, let's move on to the next presentation. So our next speaker is Gifty Atia from River Lower University. Um, Gifty will present special variability of lake ice thickness and technology on subarctic lakes. Gifty, over to you. Um, Gifty, are you oh, okay? You're you're mute. Please can see my screen. Sorry. Yes, we can see your screen and we can hear you well. Go Thank ahead. You. Hi everyone, my name is Gifty and I'm a PhD candidate in Wolf Laurier. And um, today I'll be touching a bit on my research, which is looking at the spatial variability of lake ice thickness and phenology on sub Arctic lakes in the Northwest Territories. So lakes play an important role in the physical and biological and chemical processes of freshwater in cold regions. And it's very important to energy and water cycles as well. However, when it comes as a resource, lakes is good for transportation of goods and services where winter roads are built or lead to places which would otherwise be inaccessible. However, one of the major challenges when it comes to lake ice has to do with its sensitivity to climate change. And because of that, the reported warming in the North a northern hemisphere has an impact on when lakes begin to form, the duration it has, and when it begins to melt. Despite this, there has been a reduction in lake ice in situ monitoring globally as well as in Canada, and this is due to the adoption of new methods. And one of these methods has to do with modeling. Modeling normally um, uses in situ data and station data. However, in our region of study, there is a limited distribution of in situ or station data. This is why we decided to capitalize on using a multi-method approach involving remote sensing and modeling to be able to analyze the changes of lake ice over time. So what area are we looking at? So first of all, we are focusing on the Northwest Territories. 
particularly the North Slave region in that region. This is because it has several lakes with different depth sizes, different areas and elevation, and allows us to be able to monitor how this impacts lake ice formation, as well as it is very important to community members who rely on this lake ice for transportation purposes. So our first question, however, is, is it really warming? Is, it, is the temperature trend really increasing on these lakes? And if it is, how can we be able to assess this? So first of all, we, we understand that remote sensors have the capability of detecting changes and also provide continuous data for monitoring. So we capitalize on this importance. And specifically, because we are looking at several lakes at the same time, we are focusing on using um, lake surface temperature, which we retrieve from the thermal bands of the Landsat. Now, what this does is Landsat provides a high resolution, relatively high resolution, which allows us to be able to look at small lakes as less as 0.1 kilometers square, and the changes go happening in temperature trends. So to retrieve lake surface temperature from Landsat, we capitalize on a few equations by him et al. and modify to suit our state area. So first of all, we have to be able to generate the top of the atmosphere radiance, which allows us to correct for um, sensor error and other features. Then we can be able to calculate the brightness temperature received on this sensor and use it for further estimation of lake ice. Now, to be able to do this, it's important to account for the emissivity and the atmospheric correction of this as well. And with that, be able to assess whether snow, whether um, the lake surface is covered with snow or ice or water and use that emissivity to be able to calculate it. When it comes to atmospheric correction, one important thing is getting some radio sun data from surrounding communities. But as I said, it's impossible to do that or there's a limitation there. So this study uses era five data and uses water vapor data as a, a way of correcting for atmospheric interactions um, in this study. So finally, we do cloud masking, land masking, and then quality assessment to make sure that the values that we are extracting are correct and also can be able to provide a clear picture of what's going on. This, with this, we generate lake surface temperature products or lake surface temperature analysis. So what are we seeing in terms of um, lake surface temperature on these lakes? So first of all, we are looking at this in three different um, connotations. We look at it in the transitional months. The reason for looking at the transitional months is because most of the lakes in our study area begins to melt in May and then begins to form in October. So having an outlook into this month allow us to see if it's getting warmer and if this is impacting how lakes are formed on this area. Now with the open water season, we look at this because it gives us a clear idea as to the heat stored in the lakes. And this is also important for lake ice formation. So judging from we've been able to notice that there is a shift in distribution of lake surface temperature towards warmer temperature, looking at all the lakes collectively. So with this, it gives us an idea that there is an increase in trend. And this can be seen from this figure where we see that transitional months are increasing faster, the rate of um, lake surface temperature is increasing faster in transitional months compared to the open water season. Now, this um, result concurred with recent findings, which shows the increase in temperature occurring in the month of October. So now that it has been established that the lakes in this region are getting warmer, our next step, or that is the main question, is how are we able to monitor the long-term distribution of lake ice on this lake, and how does this um, temperature influences the lake ice. Now we capitalize on using a lake, um, thermodynamic lake ice model um, because it, uh, it has been proven to be able to provide long-term trends and understanding of how lakes have uh, progressed over time in terms of its thickness as well as its phenology. That being said, with this particular study, instead of using input resource from station data, we use satellite and reanalysis data because we want to look at this distribution on the lakes as well as we want to get continuous data. And as I mentioned, in our region, there isn't there's a limitation with regard to that. Now to report, uh, reporting is also a very important thing in this study because we believe that it's important that uh, the people who interact with this lake know what is happening. And one of the ways to do that is to provide continuous monitoring mediums. And because of the data um, data received from satellite and reanalysis data on a continuous basis, we can be able to achieve this over time. 
So let's talk a bit about thymol grade, which is the model. This is the name we give to the model. Now, it is developed from the one-dimensional Canadian lake ice model. This model has been used in several uh, studies and its robustness has been tested and has proven to be effective in monitoring lake ice. So what we do is instead of using station data, we can use graded data and that is why we call it thermal grade. And then with this, we are able to specially distribute the thermodynamic lake ice model on these lakes. And this allows us to be able to see where lakes begin to form or the region in which it forms when it begins to melt and the differences in thickness on the lake based on um, input data. So um, one thing that this is, one thing this does is it expands the capability of time when accounts for spatial variability. So let's look at climate on large lakes. What are the input models? So be, for temperature data, we use models because for large lakes, um, we are working with Great State Lake and Great Bear Lake, which is above like 20,000 kilometers spread. So we are able to use a one kilometer spatial resolution to simulate the ice thickness on this. And then we get other climate variables, humidity, snowfall, wind, and cloud cover from Eurofight. With this, we are able to um, simulate ice thickness on each grid, freeze up and break up on the scale. Now, how is the model structured? It is a Python model. That means we've done it in a way that it can be installed in any device and anyone with competences would can be able to use it. And to be able to do this, you have to input it in input uh, variables, which the file setup allows you to do. So you can put your snow density, um, your mixing depth, among other variables. And then with your data, you can be able to simulate and then the, uh, generate time series for each grid, as well as spatial maps, daily spatial map for each grid. Now, with the evaluation of large lakes, we've noticed that thermal grid has a tendency to underestimate um, this, um, the output of, um, uh, of thickness, underestimate thickness. And this is something we also work in to calibrate the model better. So the next thing is, how is it different on small lakes? I've already spoken about large lakes. So what are the challenges with small lakes? First of all, we do not have an existing um, input data like models for small lakes. So this is where we have to kind of modify climate to achieve this. And then in order to do this, we have to use Landsat data. And this is where extraction of lake surface temperature for Landsat coming because that becomes our first point of call for the model. And it's filled with other data sources due to the poor temporary resolution of Landsat. So in combination with ERA-5, just like um, last time, we'll be able to have model iteration for each of the 535 lakes that I mentioned earlier, and then generate data for this. The goal here is to be able to report what we see so that it's easy for you to know what is changing on the lakes and how temperature is influencing this. So this is an example of one day, just one day of our, uh, of our set, so second generation 2020. And you can see that within the lake, as well as between lakes, there is differences in lake ice thickness. Well, this is our first run, so I cannot speak a lot on this. However, with just our first run, we've been able to notice that the onset of breakup is earlier over time from 1984 to present, and the onset of freeze up is becoming later. So this is something that is important to know for planning purposes and for safety issues as well. So in summary, climate grid has the capability of specially distributing lake ice thickness on large lakes, which has been established. And on small lakes, it can be modified and we're working on it to achieve this. Secondly, we have established that lakes in the Northwest territories are getting warmer, which affect lake ice processes. And there is a reduction based on the few um, points we've looked so far, there is seem to be a reduction in lake ice thickness and duration of lake ice. Now in our outlook, we wanna further more, uh, calibrate the model and also do some impact variable assessment to see how the different variables like depth, uh, size, climate change, and all those things affect how lake ice are formed. And the main goal for this research is that we believe that reporting on lake ice trends is very important for planning, safety purposes, and for knowledge sharing as well. These are a few references that our research was based on, and also um, we'd like to thank all these institutions, one way or the other, supporting our work. And also thank you for lending me your ear. And this brings me to the end of my presentation. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gifty. I might be biased by great presentation. <laughs> so we do have uh, time for questions. 
Um, I assert question um, why the people are uh, warming up. <laughs> uh, one question for you, Gifty, uh, for um, for over 500 lakes that you are looking for, um, bathymetry data is one of the limitation. How you might be dealing with this issue? Because there is no way that you get bathymetry data, right? Yes. So currently, there are two ways we are dealing with this issue. First of all, we have some archives where we are trying to extract bathymetry data from. And secondly, we are trying to use um, their studies which have used Landsat data in terms of um, the spectral reflectance and also temperature to be able to kind of estimate um, the distribution of that. So we, that is the next goal to capitalize on these two mediums to be able to get bathymetry from this. Thank you very much. Dr. Brown, please go ahead. Hi, Gifty, I missed something you said earlier. Um, did you say that Climo was uh, Climo grid was overestimating or underestimating the ice thickness that you found? Underestimating that. Oh, it's underestimating. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. And have you looked into why yet, or is that still ongoing? Yeah, that's still ongoing. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Dr. Gunn, please go ahead. Hi, <laughs> Thanks for the presentation. Um, I was just wondering, on, on kind of an aggregate basis, what proportion of the dates would you expect to have the temperature data from Landsat or MODIS restricted by cloud cover during your analysis? Um, so far, it, it, um, with the Landsat, I can speak for the fact that um, we, we can get about 80% of the data so far based on the analysis done. And with the MODIS, um, it, it's actually a bit less with the MODIS with about 70%, but I cannot really tell for a fact because it depends on each lake. So each lake, we have different percentage of cloud that I can uh, that is generated from that. But so far, we can only get 80%. And already Landsat is having a poor resolution, temporary resolution. So that also is another challenge that we're trying to correct with other data sources. Thank you. Yeah, 80 to 90% is, is still a lot higher than I expected. So that's great. Thank you. We have one more question in the chat from Taylor. Uh, thanks, Gifty. My understanding is that the era five two meter air temperature has been shown to be biased from accuracy in the Arctic. Do you know that, uh, what impact these biases may have on your result? Um, so thank you very much for your question, but we do not actually use the era five um, air temperature data. So that does not um, influence this model. So thank you for your question. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Gifty. For the interest of time, we move on to the next speaker. Thanks. Our next speaker is uh, Alexis Robinson. She she's presenting improving like a simulation in Canadian based on in can in Canada based on lake size. So, Alexis, over to you. Thank you. All right. Can you see the screen? Yes. Can see the screen. Okay. We can see you well. Uh, hear you well. All right, so good afternoon. I'm Alexis, and I am a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto. And today I'm going to be presenting on improving lake ice simulations in Canada based on lake size. So I'm going to be building it probably a little bit on Gifty and uh, Gifty's presentation here. Um, so in terms of global lake abundance or freshwater lake abundance, um, it is greatest for uh, highest for latitudes between 45 to 75 degrees north. And the aerial extent of many of these freshwater lakes is predominantly dominated by medium and large lakes. And here I'm going to actually define them for you. So medium lakes um, have been often defined as any lakes between one to 100 square kilometers and large lakes as lakes greater than 100 square kilometers. And many of these lakes um, do experience some form of ice cover throughout the year and research shows that that ice cover duration is declining, uh, has been declining over the long term. And it has been declining for many lakes, both uh, within the temperate Arctic and mountainous regions. In addition, a number of great lakes are also increasingly transitioning from annual to intermittent winter ice cover, in particular in the high latitudes where these regions are warming at twice the global mean. Now, why is this important? So we know that uh, the decline in ice cover duration has also been consistent with long-term changes in climatic drivers responsible for ice formation uh, generation and growth and decay. And what we're actually seeing is, is that um, in some cases, ice formation is uh, occurring later 
there's also been less ice growth and often decay or break uh, breakup is occurring earlier. And is these changes in the duration of ice cover are going to have negative implications for global climate as well as regional climate, hydrological events, um, biological processes, and it will also impact uh, the human communities that rely on ice cover. So one of the methods that uh, we can use to help study uh, these lakes is through lake ice modeling. And lake ice models have been used to study both current and projected changes on ice covered lakes. I will be focusing on the Canadian lake ice model, which as Gifty stated, was a, is a well-tested one-dimensional thermodynamic freshwater lake ice model that has been used to um, adequately model ice phenology for smaller Arctic lakes. However, when we used this model in Halliburton, Ontario recent, uh, a few years ago, um, what ended up happening for temperate region uh, lakes is that it underpredicted ice thickness and ice off. So recent work that we've done shows that by adjusting the albedo parameterization for both snow and ice within Climo resulted in a better representation of temperate region lake ice cover. So what I'll be doing in this uh, uh, presentation is looking at comparing observed and simulated ice phenology dates for lakes uh, contained within the Canadian ice database and then some additional lakes um, that are also within the National Snow and Ice Data Center database. And first up, what I'm gonna do is try to identify where, which model to use. So using climo or climo temperate, using uh, vegetation and the snow line as a climate proxy, as well as to determine if lake size can be used as an adjustment factor to account for the delay in ice off for both medium and large sized lakes. So in terms of my study sites, um, I don't have as many um, as Gifty did, but that's because they're from within those data so I have 168 uh, study lakes. The majority of them are medium-sized lakes, um, which I have about 86 of, and then I have 46 large lakes. And I tried to make sure that I had a good distribution of lakes across Canada within that database. So in terms of the methods and materials I'm using, um, so I have the two databases that contain the lake ice uh, phenology information. I also did use climate data from Environment and Climate Change Canada. And then I also had um, some historical uh, snow survey data from the Canadian Historical Snow Survey um, data set. And that primarily is the snow density data that um, is required for the model. So in pre-processing, I went to extract um, lakes from those data sets. I made sure that I had records of more than 15 years in order to validate the model. I also had to take the climate data and put it into a daily time step for forcing the model. And then I also um, used the snow density, um, which was underland uh, per pixel for each lake from the uh, historical snow survey data set. And that is I uh, used varying in density. So that's basically I used density for every two weeks uh, period over the winter months. And then I also did so the model selection at this stage. From there, I did um, my simulations and validations. So in terms of the uh, snow cover, I had to vary the snow cover conditions in order to represent um, the snow distribution across the lakes. And I went with a 0% snow cover, a 50% snow cover, and a 100% snow cover to get a range of ice on and ice off dates. And then from there, I looked at the model performance. So I compared the simulated versus the uh, observed ice on and ice off dates. For this presentation, I'm gonna be showing the mean absolute error um, because of what the next step will be, which is looking at um, the, the ice off dates versus lake size. And then from there, I did an initial plot and then I did a cluster analysis using a probability model in order to determine additional uh, lake size groupings. Um, and also just to make some definitions clear, I'm using ice on um, as a definition as the first day when the water is completely ice covered and ice off as the first day in which the water is completely free of ice. So in terms of the methodology, this is just a schematic of climo. So you have your input variables, um, which are all the uh, climate forcing data and then some defined parameters. So for mixed layer depth um, for these lakes, I did have, I used the mean depth in order to determine that mixing layer information. And then I ran uh, several simulations for the snow accumulation and then snow density as well, um, which I adjusted for each of the regions based on uh, field work that has been done previously by other researchers. And then I also um, obviously used uh, different ice and snow albedo for those temperate region lakes. I'm gonna be focusing on the 
um, ice on and ice off, and that's validated using the Canadian ice database and the snow and ice data, data center database. So just to show the model selection, um, how that process worked, um, so you can see here, the light blue lakes are climo and the dark lakes are climo temperate. So we do have this nice um, range of lakes in terms of uh, where they're presented. Um, some regions where we might have thought that might have been climo, um, they're actually, these five lakes here in Saskatchewan are over, are in an area of grassland and they also experience warm summers. And so actually perform better using climo temperate. And again, in the Maritimes, um, there's lakes that are overlying the boreal forest area. However, they do experience warm summers. And again, um, we're better at modeling, uh, being modeled using the um, climate temperate. So in terms of the overall results for the entire data set, for ice on, you can see here that it ranged for all lake sizes um, between uh, 2 to 13 uh, days. Um, in terms of that ice on, however, with ice off, you can see here for the mean absolute error, um, the smallest range was for the smaller smaller lakes, so they ranged from four to 21 days, depending on the snow scenario, and that um, we did expect. And then the other thing that you can see here, as you go up in lake size, that mean absolute error, the maximum day, does increase for both medium and large size lakes. And then these are the results where I did the initial plots of looking at lake surface area versus the mean absolute error um, or versus the uh, surface area. And you can see here that there is um, almost, there's no relationship between the two. However, you can see some distinct uh, clustering under the 20 uh, square kilometers and then a little bit in the uh, larger sizes of those lakes. When you get to the larger lakes, there is actually a little bit more, there's a weaker positive relationship where you're seeing increasing uh, mean absolute error in the uh, ice off um, with uh, larger lake size. However, you do see some distinct clustering as well, especially with lakes under um, 5,000 square kilometers. And that's because the data set has quite a bit more lakes in that size category. And then what you see here at this, uh, where you see the straight line of uh, points in all of the figures, that's actually Great Slave Lake. And there's actually several data points for that particular lake. And so that's just showing you the different um, ice off points for that lake. Okay, so some of the cluster analysis results, this is for the medium lakes. I've got uh, all of them showing each of the snow scenarios, but I'm going to concentrate on the 100% snow scenario. But what we see here is I did five clusters. This is a much larger data set than the large lakes. So it's about 86 lakes. So I did five clusters for this particular one. Um, and what you can see here is through each of the data sets, there is some overlap um, between the clusters uh, between one to 25 square kilometers. So there's actually two groups and I'm going to go into more detail to show you how those look. The other thing that happened was um, at that level, uh, you also had between the 100% uh, snow scenario, the 50% and the 0%. Often what actually happened was is in one scenario, it would cluster as group one, but as you move to 50 or zero, uh, percent snow, it, some of the lakes switched cl clusters. So that will also require a little bit further refinement of this. So in terms of the first cluster I'm going to show, this is I'm only going to do two clusters here, and these are the larger ones. So cluster two, which had a surface area of one to eight square kilometers, has a fairly weak positive relationship, but you still see um, outside that 95% confidence level quite a bit of um, outliers as well. Um, within this one. However, when you go to cluster four, which is from one to 25 square kilometers, so these are the lakes that kind of match up with it, you can see here that there is a, a slightly better relationship between the days off and the lake uh, surface area as well, although we do have some outliers. And then this is just to show you a comparison of the two, and you can see where that overlap is happening um, with them. And then for the large lake clusters, Again, I did only did three clusters because there were um, less data points. So it was only 46. Also, we could clearly see three um, clusters from the initial um, figure. So what I'm gonna pull out here at the 100% snow scenario is the one between 100 and 1700 square kilometers. It also, it's a fairly flat relationship here as well. So this is gonna take a little bit more research as to see what's happening here. 
So in terms of the summary, um, so the results did lead to a refinement in model selection by using vegetation extent and snow line as a proxy for climate. Our ISON simulations ranged from two to 13 days, so fairly adequate for all the lakes. And our ISOF simulations did confirm that as you increase in lake size, the, um, max, the maximum uh, absolute, mean absolute error increased. However, our ongoing work is gonna look at doing a regional analysis of the lake ISOF to size, as well as trying to tease out why some of the clusters, uh, why some of the lakes are clustering together for two different clusters as well. And I'd just like to take the time to thank um, some of these people as well. Thank you very much for the great presentation, Alex. So we do have quite, we do have time for questions. So if you have questions again, please raise your hand, speak up or uh, put it on a text. Um, while we are waiting, so I can ask one question. Um, so if I if I'm not mistaken, you select a different lake, in different sizes. You show the medium size results, right? And the large size as well. And the large yeah. size, but yeah. What was what was the the number of the different sizes and uh, like like how, the number of lakes in each category? Yeah, I was I was I was wondering what was the strategy of selecting different sizes and how many uh, lakes. Um, in so it category. came down to unfortunately the data sets that we had. Uh, so I was looking for lakes that had more than fifteen records in order to do the comparison, um, and within the Canadian ICE database and the um, and CDEC one as well, there was more medium sized lakes. So that's why there ended up being more of that particular lake. And then the other thing that happened, if there was uh, lakes that had less sites or less data points, I had to exclude them even if they were, um, gave more uh, variability or more size, um, size selection. So unfortunately the sizes also came from what lakes they were monitoring. Or what were being monitors as opposed to me going out to to monitor them or using satellite data okay so obviously you had more medium-sized lakes in your categories and because climo is 1d i'm just wondering if you have in you had enough enough lakes in the small and large size to to compare which uh, category works better with climo because i mean when is 1D, so it works better with medium and small size rather than large. Yeah, right? yeah for sure. So have you ever had a chance to look at that? Um, I haven't yet, but I do have 36 small lakes plus our own field sites as well. So I guess it would bounce it up to about almost 40 lakes in that category. And then I have 46 large lakes. But the problem with the large lakes is they're mostly clustered between 100 and 5,000 square kilometers. So we don't have a lot after the 5,000 square kilometer size. So. Awesome. Great, very well done. Thank you, thank you very much. You're welcome. Awesome, so we, we're gonna move on to the next uh, presenters, which we have two posters. Um, one, Dr. Marshall's uh, um, meltwater freezing and retention on the Greenland ice sheet. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Marshalls is not here now to present it. Um, however, there is extra session for the posters. If you have questions and that you want to discuss, you can always go and have more discussion with the presenters. The next um, speaker and the poster presenter is um, Ariana, Ariana Mansi. Uh, Ariana will talk about the projection of lake ice thickness and phenology under representative um, RCP scenarios. Ariana, over to you. You have about five minutes to present your poster. Okay, everything's good? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. So to start off, climate change has been a topic of discussion both among the public and the scientists. Yet despite this increase in attention, we still lack a complete understanding of climate change, especially the far future effects. But we do cause being humans, specifically our greenhouse gas emissions. So to fill in our knowledge gaps and to provide insights on how climate change impacts are going to look like based off our emissions, we use representative concentration pathways or RCP for short to project four different emission pathways, which is RCP 2.6, 4.0, 6.0, and 8.5. So 
These numbers correspond to the radioactive forcing in watt per meter squared by 2100. Thus, RCP 2.6 projected a decrease in greenhouse gas emission is an optimistic scenario and vice versa for 8.5, which is our pessimistic scenario. So, this study utilizes Lake Ice as climate change proxies due to their sensitivity to atmospheric changes. These potential impacts are then tailored based off the four RCPs as previously mentioned through a pre-existing model called MRICGCM3. This is a coupled global climate model that produces changes in climatic variables for each RCP with the focus being on key lake ice variables, which is cloud cover, humidity, snowfall, wind speed, and air temperature. The projection of these variables then serve as input values into climate grid, which Gifty has previously mentioned is a thermodynamic lake ice model that produces changes in ice thickness and phenology. This also considers snow variability through snow scenarios of 25, 50, 75, and 100%. These values represent the percentage of snow retained. This study focuses on the 75% snow scenario as snow on this lake ice surface wouldn't be subjected to convection heat as it would if it was on land, but some loss would still be expected from melt or wind effects. So now moving on to the results. The graph you see here depicts lake ice thickness of, the, of Great Barrier during winter months using a five-year roll and average. We see variability is in all four pathways, but RCP 8.5 depicting the most variability, then RCP 2.6 depicts the least amount of variability. This variability you see here negatively correlates with the projected air temperature, where a decrease in the air temperature would cause an increase in ice thickness. Thus, we can conclude that this variability we're seeing here is from air temperature projections. So additionally, Great Slave Lake does experience this similar lake ice patterns that you're seeing on the graph, but due to the warmer temperatures of about 2.5 Celsius warmer on average compared to Great Bear Lake. This causes the lake ice to be 12.39 centimeters thinner on average. This is likely due to Great Slave Lake having a greater lake depth and being at a lower latitude than Great Bear Lake. So comparing the different RCP values, the model projects that RCP 2.5 to have consistently cooler temperatures, which is allowing for the increase in ice thickness and duration in comparison to the other pathways. But the opposite occurs for RCP 8.5. Five. This variability depicted on the graph, as previously mentioned, is most likely from the air temperature. So this would be caused by the MRICGCM3 marginally lower climate sensitivity of 2.11 Kelvin in comparison to other multi-models that typically ranges from 2.1 Kelvin to 4.4. This could cause a reduction in climate response to increase in greenhouse gases. However, further investigation would be necessary to assess this theory. Another possible explanation could be the large spatial resolution of this model being 125 kilometers, consequently causing a simplification of variables, reducing its accuracy. In conclusion, further assessment of this model is necessary to create conclusive results. These results, however, project that with higher greenhouse gas emissions, there's going to be increased variability in ice thickness, duration, and air temperatures, projecting that under the 8.5 scenario, or RCP, there would be a drastic dip in ice thickness for both lakes around 2085. This would require migration or mitigation strategies to be implemented before this period. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Ariana. Great presentation. Um, we have one question, uh, Murray asking, Ariana, great thesis project, the model result pathways um, illustrate an interesting story. What model resolution would you like to utilize? Well, it would have been ideal if the, so the reason why the resolution is fairly large is because of the MRI CG CM3 resolution. It is really large, the ideal would be to have it smaller, maybe around one kilometer as opposed to 125. So just a smaller spatial resolution would have been the most ideal. Great, thank you. Great work, Ariana. Thank you very much. And uh, now we are um, switching the topic from moving from ice, ice uh, simulation to snow mapping. Our next speaker is uh, Alicia Pau from Laurier. She will talk about um, evaluation of snow depth stripe from ground penetrating radar on Canadian subarctic lakes. Uh, Alicia, over to you. Awesome, thank you, sorry. Um, okay, so thank you. Um, hello all, so my name is Alicia um, and thank you Homa for the introduction. 
Um, sorry, let me just move you guys out of the way. Uh, so as mentioned, uh, today I'm presenting our work on the evaluation of snow depth derived from ground penetrating radar on Canadian subarctic lakes. Uh, so today I will be discussing how we uh, um, use an automated GPR processing workflow that accurately identifies the ice surface beneath the snow cover across lake ice and how this advance, advancement encourages the collection of large GPR data sets by alleviating much of that complexity and labor involved with the post-processing of GPR data, um, while also being able to measure uh, snow depth over lake ice accurately and efficiently. So to begin, I will give a bit of introduction on lake ice and snow, um, then jump into where and how we deployed this method. So at this point, we know warming in northern Canada is occurring, and it's occurring at twice the global rate. As we can see here, the most prominent changes are occurring in the winter months, as this is showing the seasonal mean air temperature change from 1948 to 2016. As well, um, we're also seeing changes in the amount of precipitation. So the seasonal precipitation change over 1948 to 2012 is seen here again with the majority changes occurring in the winter months for northern Canada. And so we know that these changes affecting Canada's north are projected to continually increase. And because snow and ice can exist so close to their melting point, the changes um, in our climate will affect these two components of the cryosphere directly. So with talking about snow, snow alone can affect the formation and thickness of ice in two ways. So when snow is present on uh, the on top of lake ice, it can form snow ice, so also known as white ice. And what occurs is when the ice surface is exposed to water and there's snow present, it can refreeze, whether it be through precipitation falling as a rain, a snow melt, or water flooding up through cracks. Um, and this is just shown on the right here. So that is um, two pictures of snow ice. Then there's snow on congelation ice, so also known as black ice. Um, and what happens is the snow inhibits the heat exchange from the water column to the atmosphere um, and what it, it slows the growth of congelation ice. So with an increase in snow depth, um, we can expect that the rate of ice growth in the water column will slow and the variability of the snow depth across the lake um, will also affect the thickness. So this is uh, mainly due to the thermodynamic processes. Um, so with discussing how the distribution and depth of snow over lake ice varies, uh, this is important for us to understand for numerical weather predictions and modeling, as we just heard a lot about. Um, so a good estimate of snow is required to improve the accuracy, for example, with thermodynamic lake ice modeling, um, which again, we just heard so much about during this session. Um, so an accurate snow depth measurement is needed, um, but are hard to come by. So current methods require a great deal of time spent in the field and snow measurements over land are just not comparable to the snow distribution over lakes. And I mean, that's because the wind is going to affect the snow distribution a lot more over lakes with an open area than that over land with different vegetation or uh, forest covers, for example. So then why is modeling lake ice important? Oh my gosh, sorry. <laughs> so then why is modeling lake ice important? Again, this has been touched on in previous presentations. But other than ice and snow being indicators of climate change, northern communities rely on lake ice for recreational use and um, livelihood, such as fishing, as well as a source of transportation through ice roads, um, which allow for them to receive goods and supplies. But I mean, with the change in uncertainty with the change in climate, lake ice can pose as a health and safety risk. So this brings us to, well, then how might we measure snow? And this has been done using instruments such as an automated snow depth probe. So like the Magna probe pictured here on the left, um, which has been proven to be time consuming and provide limited coverage, but is a great validation tool. But it can also be done using ground penetrating radar. So what happens is GPR, the GPR sends out an electromagnetic wave measuring the two way travel time that it takes for the signal to travel through the medium. And when reaching a boundary, in this case, the snow ice boundary, it reflects back to the receiving antenna. So with that, we can collect snow depth information continuously along transects if given a snow density to convert the travel time to depth. And so this brings us to the question, well, how accurately can we derive snow depth from ground penetrating radar over lake ice? And that's what we're gonna answer here today. 
So while seasonal snow depth over land has been accurately quantified, a research gap does exist on lake ice um, where shallow snow depths are present um, as they cause additional challenges for GPR signal interpreting and processing, um, as well as over lake ice methods have just been limited at capturing the snow's heterogeneity due to the lack of spatial coverage uh, traditional methods are capable of. So with asking how accurately can we measure snow depth using GPR? Well, we visited four lakes just north of Yellowknife Northwest Territories uh, during early winter 2021 season. So data collection took place between December 7th to December 14th. And then uh, we actually went back and revisited Landing Lake in late season. So on March 27th, 2022. So um, these four lakes showed different characteristics in terms of surface area and depth. And um, so we thought it would, um, so we would expect the external factors such as wind and surrounding vegetation would affect the distribution of the snow over the lake differently. And so on the right here, um, we can see the four lakes and the gray area is actually showing us the area that data collection took place. Um, so for Finger Lake, we covered it entirely, um, but for Landing, uh, Long Lake and V Lake, um, we just uh, sampled a portion of it. So in the areas that we did cover, um, we wanted to capture snow near the shorelines as well as in the open areas um, of the lake. So now um, here we're looking at our setup in the field um, where we used a one gigahertz sensor paired with the ice map system from sensors and software. And um, we used the one gigahertz sensor due to the amount of detail it can provide within the shallow snowpack uh, compared to that of um, let's say the 500 megahertz. And then we also set up an external GPS to record uh, data simultaneously with the GPR traces um, and had a local base station uh, set up on the lake. Uh, so this was primarily done just to improve the spatial data for the collected transects. Now here um, we're looking at an example of the data collected. So uh, this is showing V Lake. Um, so it, collected, it was collected on December 14th, 2021. Um, on the left, we're seeing the GPR transects, uh, while on the right um, is showing the in-situ snow depth measurement location as the small black dots uh, that do look like lines, um, and they were collected using the magna probe, while the density was taken at the yellow locations. So now to process the data, we took the radar grams and applied signal processing. Um, so we're currently looking at an unprocessed radar gram along a 250 meter transect on Landing Lake. So the exact location can be seen here on the right in the map. So looking at this radar gram, we see a lot of noise. Um, we see the direct wave, uh, which is covering the snow ice interface. Um, as with shallow snow, it's challenging to identify the snow ice boundary because of this interference between that direct wave and the reflection from the snow ice. Uh, boundary. But then we can see the ice water interface um, very clearly. So what we did is we applied a bandpass filter, a time zero correction, and a simple background subtraction that cleaned up the radar gram to this here. And so now uh, we can clearly see the air snow, snow ice, and ice water interface. Then through adapting an algorithm, uh, we automatically picked the two-way travel time at these interfaces, um, which we can see here. So we have the blue lines showing these two-way travel time picks um, with the legend just at the bottom uh, for which color is what. Um, and then, uh, so through using this travel time, we can then calculate the snow depth, um, which was just done using an average density for each lake, um, which then allowed us to use a constant wave speed. And now uh, the bottom graph is then just showing us the picks as a function of elevation. So with having derived the snow depth uh, from GPR to a travel time, we can look at the transects on each lake. So over the four lakes, uh, with transects totaling 38 kilometers and observations being collected approximately every nine centimeters, uh, we resulted with close to 500,000 snow depth observations uh, just for our four days spent in December. Now to evaluate the accuracy of the snow depth derived from the GPR, uh, we did apply a six meter radius around each magna probe measurement and applied distance weighting to 50% of the closest match snow depth data. And uh, with that, we saw a high level of correlation with an average R squared value of 0 0.62. 
and a root mean square error under um, just under two and a half centimeters across the four lakes. So we did apply a seven centimeter threshold as a limitation of the GPR, um, being able to drive snow depth that shallow. While we also accounted for the depression of the magna probe basket by adding a centimeter and a half to the in situ data. And we applied this um, to all four lakes to avoid adding bias. Now, um, to further evaluate the accuracy of this method, we did revisit Landing Lake in March, as mentioned. Um, and the reason for this was to test our method on a deeper snowpack. So uh, while the correlation, so we can see the statistics just on the left here, um, the correlation is improved. Uh, we could expect this um, because the minimum snow depth uh, being seen in March is around 25 centimeters, while the minimum in December was a lot less between five to 10 centimeters. And while we do see a slight, slightly larger root mean square error and mean absolute error, the overall error um, measured in March was reported is reported as plus or minus 5%. And in December, we reported as plus or minus 8.5%. So a slight increase. So with proving this method accurate, um, that brings us to um, mapping snow. Um, so we can then take the estimated snow depth observations and create uh, this, these snow depth maps. So here we just used inverse distance weighting and created a one meter resolution map across the areas traversed um, where, we are, where we're now able to identify spatial variability and look closer at the distribution around shorelines uh, compared to that in the open areas. So overall, uh, we accurately estimated snow depth from ground penetrating radar within plus or minus 10% air um, for early and late snowpacks with applying a seven centimeter threshold um, and collected close to 500,000 snow depth observations derived from GPR in just five days. Um, and the success of our method uh, shows promise as a technique uh, for accurately estimating snow over lake ice in not only a timely manner, um, but also with large spatial coverage. Uh, that previous methods such as uh, the automated snow depth probe or ruler lacked. And through producing these snow depth maps um, with a high spatial resolution, the heterogeneity of the snow on lake ice can be further understood. And uh, lastly, the increased availability of snow depth data over lake ice um, will be an asset to numerical and climate modeling. For example, thermodynamic lake ice modeling, uh, which we've been talking so much about. <laughs> And so thank you. Um, I would just like to thank you all for the, your taking the time to hear my talk today, as well as a thank you to my co-authors and everyone else who has helped support this work. Um, as a lot of us also know, field work is not easy. Um, so again, a big thank you to those who helped out in the field and made this work possible. Um, I look forward to hearing um, any questions you might have. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much, Alicia. Great presentation. So we do have two questions. Uh, the first question from Frederick. So Alicia, do you account for the mechanical compaction due to the machine? Okay, so a very common question, um, and I did actually prepare some slides just in case this did come up. Um, so uh, although the sled is compacting in terms of using the GPR, um, so overall we did not account for the compaction because um, when using GPR, uh, as we can see in the first slide, the sled is causing compaction, but in the second photo, we can see that the snowmobile is not actually displacing any snow. So if the mass of the snow that is being displaced is minimal, um, we can actually assume compaction has very little effect on the calculated snow depth. And this is because the signal is measuring that two-way travel time it takes to travel through a specific mass of snow. So if the mass doesn't change, um, then the two-way travel time should ideally stay the same. Great, it seems that you are well prepared for this question. <laughs> Next question, uh, Flamuri. Uh, why was the feed for the GPR data in, to in situ on Long Lake poorer? Sorry? So he's asking why the data, the validation for Long Lake was uh, poorer or less accurate than the others. Um, oh, sorry, where did I go? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it could potentially be, um, so Long Lake was the longest area that we did cover. Um, the lake uh, was about, um, I think it was close to three to five kilometers long. Um, and so it was more so uh, vertical transects um, and we didn't cover, let's see, much of the like whole area. But um, so because of the shape of the lake, we would expect the wind to um, potentially affect 
the density more. Um, and so maybe we potentially just didn't uh, represent the density well enough in our measurements. Um, but we also, yeah, we're not we're not quite sure um, why that might be. Other than that, next question. okay. Next question, Dr. Gunn, please go ahead. Hi, Alicia. Thanks very much for the presentation. Um, I did actually have that the question, same question that Frederick had about the uh, uh, mechanical compaction due to the machine. I, I was thinking about uh, also. You mentioned that there was a single um, wave speed that you had used to, by accounting for the the dielectric properties of the snow. So does that account for the compaction in the snow that you observed? Well, it doesn't because we use, yeah, so we just use one average density. Um, and so uh, we- Was that collected like with, in, within the compacted area, the density measurement? So actually, no, it was taken. So yeah, so our density measurements were taken in the fresh snow beside it before the compaction. So yeah, so although the density is changing and we rely on the density to calculate the snow depth from the two-way travel time, as long as we have the density of the fresh snow, so before the compaction, then we should be able to accurately measure the snow depth um, without seeing an impact. And actually, um, if the density was to affect it, we did look, sorry, I prepared this also. Um, we did, I did do a quick sensitivity analysis on the impact density is having based on, uh, we did have limited coverage in terms of our sampling points, looking at the standard deviation um, versus the mean and looking at the sensitivity, it only would affect, or at least what we saw affected the snow depth um, under half a centimeter for early, um, snowpack, whereas around one centimeter for late snowpack in terms of the density variability. Okay, thank you. I just I had, I, I had a thought because it looked like a couple of your one-to-one -one plots, but there was a little bit of underestimation based on the GPR um, derived snow depth. So that kind of made sense that the compaction or the measurement of the density when you're calculating that wave speed may be influenced by that uh, by this, either the snow machine or the density. So I wonder yeah. if there's a little small correction that can be applied there that would even improve your results. Yeah, definitely something I could look into. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, last question from Alex says, uh, says, for your interpolation, why did you use IDW, uh, not something like Craigin? Um, Good question. Uh, we just, based on the spatial coverage we had, um, we just used, um, yeah, inverse distance weighting. Um, but uh, definitely something that we can look further into. Um, next steps would be also incorporating uh, photogrammetry, um, UAV um, elevations and such with the modeling of the snow surface to then be able to interpolate the larger area. So um, yeah, just currently, that's what we have been looking at. Perfect. Thank you all. Thank you, Alicia. Great work. We move on to our next presenter. So, uh, Rosemary Totan, she is presenting variability in Thermocarst lake size, elev um, elevation, and connectivity in the Western Canadian Arctic. Rosie, over to you. Thanks, Homa. Uh, screen's okay? Yes. All okay. good. The floor is right. So, hi everyone. I know we have people from across time zones. So, good afternoon or evening. My name is Rosie Tutton. I'm a research associate with Wilfrid Laurier University, Global Water Futures, and the Arctic Hydrology Research Group. I'm working out of Yellowknife Northwest Territories. Um, and I'd first like to acknowledge that the work that we're doing here is conducted on Inuvialuit lands, and I'm currently situated on Chief Dike dry yeast territory. Um, so I'm here to talk about uh, kind of a looking forward project um, and some of the work, we, work that we conducted to date as part of a multi-institutional team from Laurier and the University of Guelph, considering the variability in lake size, elevation and distribution in the Western Canadian Arctic. Uh, Oh, there we go. So with unprecedented 
unprecedented climate warming. We're seeing dramatic change hydroclimatic cycles, which alter the spatial and seasonal distribution of global surface waters. These changes to lake volume and surface area impact global energy balance, resulting in feedbacks to local and the global climate. In order to understand how these water bodies are changing in the future, we require robust predictive models supported by field observation and remote sensing products. So building predictive models and networks is challenging in Canada due to the size of our drainage basins, distribution across eco and climactic zones, and the paucity of observational networks. So Cool Valley Eyal's evaluation of Canadian hydrometric networks highlight that large parts of Canada fall below the WMO guidelines for stream flow network density. Ungaged rivers, lakes, and wetlands make up vast portions of the hydrological features um, in Canada's north. This is similar um, with our lake level monitoring across the, our northern landscapes. So the lack of ground truth data is notable in northern regions where Arctic amplification results in dramatic landscape change that's difficult to predict and mitigate. These regions, um, the, these are regions where future developments are increasingly occurring, although it remains difficult to ensure proper water quantity monitoring to support climate change studies. Um, so the surface water and ocean topography mission, so I'll just call it SWAT from here on in, it's easier, is an international multi-partner space mission intended to improve our understanding of inland and ocean waters of resolutions that are not currently possible. SWAT will provide the first comprehensive view of Earth's freshwater bodies from space and allow scientists to determine changing volumes of freshwater cosmoglobes. It employs a payload with infrarometric radar, um, which you could see that short clip um, in the K-band. This mission is intended for launch in February, 2020, and will consist of water surface elevations and water surface slopes covering nearly all of the Earth's land surface, at least once every 21 days. In 2010, NASA invited the Canadian Space Agency to contribute and incorporated Canadian scientists in SWAT validation and modeling. An airborne mission titled Air SWAT has pre previously run through Northern Canada, which can be used for site-specific validation and calibration, but the installation of the SWAT satellite will provide wide-scale elevation um, data around the globe for lakes that are currently not monitored. These lakes are critical for building robust and reliable hydrological models that can be validated across heterogeneous landscapes. So to sum that big project up, um, the broad goals of the SWAT mission are to provide global water surface elevation products, determine the rate of water gain and loss, and evaluate discharge variation. This will help improve our understanding of the global and localized water balance, which will further improve modeling efforts. The estimation of available water will assist in mitigating water, future water-related risks to infrastructure and ecosystem dynamics. So where does our <laughs> group fit in? Um, our portion of the Canadian Space Agency Lake Observation Project involves monitoring lakes in the north that are susceptible to change in order to validate the upcoming SWAT products and build product predictive models for these underrepresented watersheds. This project was funded in 2021 with work coming, uh, commencing in last August. Um, we're reporting today on the lakes that were surveyed in the first summer of measurements for baseline data prior to the SWAT launch in 2022. So step back just a little bit. <laughs> these are three maps um, showing continuous permafrost extent, high lake cover and high ground ice. We could use these to form a rudimentary model of regions at risk of lake change in the north. Overlaying these project products also provides a for, first order guess of Thermokarst Lake Drain. Um, some know them as Alice. Um, there are lakes that result from subsidence as ground lake ice below decays and can pond over frozen terrain. So Thermokarst, Dense regions, as seen in yellow on the map, you're right, 
are highly susceptible to rapid and dramatic change. A uh, warming climate coupled with permafrost thaw and precipitation change will significantly influence the hydrology of these thermocarst lakes, including changes in water surface elevation and area. So the SWAT satellite will play a key role in understanding the impact of controls such as climate, snow cover, vegetation, permafrost thaw, um, beavers influencing the networks and hydrological connectivity on the water surface elevation of these remote lakes. Lakes are also sensitive to rapid drainage resulting in ecosystem change, which will subs subsequently impact migratory birds, water availability for local species and recreational activity for those living in the area. Oh, um, going <laughs> run out of time. Um, the Thermocarst Lake Train is widespread in Northern Canada um, and particularly dominant in the hydrology of Northwest Territories. Due to the paucity of lake monitoring in the region, there's limited capacity to simulate the hydrology of these watersheds, which is where SWAT comes in. So our validation and modeling efforts focuses on the Nuvik Detector Act Duck region due to its easy access to permafrost train, a long research watershed, and existing air SWAT lake elevation data. Um, the lakes of interest are in two contrasting watersheds, Trail Valley Creek and Hands Creek, um, both of which lie within the Nuvialuit settlement region along the ITH. Um, they're located at the northern boundary of the forest ecotone, and the basin is underlaid with continuous ice-rich permafrost. So Trail Valley Creek drains roughly 58 kilometers into Husky Lakes, um, where stream flow has been monitored, monitored by Water Service Survey of Canada since 1979, um, lays host to Trail Valley Creek, which some of you might have heard of, um, where, which incorporates seasonal snow and thawed out measurements and eddy co-monitoring. Um, there's sparse lake coverage, um, though the lakes in this watershed are thoroughly measured. The research station is not far from the road, which makes it highly accessible. Hands Creek is west of Trail Valley and VITH. Um, it's lake rich with highly dense networks of streams and lakes. Um, greatest conservation are in the lowland, as you can see the top right, and we have an upland here with less area that is drained into those lakes. All right. Um, so I'll move quite a lot. <laughs> um, so in order to build a representative water level sampling plan, we needed to select a subset from 108 lakes that would be detectable from the SWAT satellite. The lakes were chosen considering surface area, elevation, connectivity, and location. Um, we had a much higher concentration of lakes in the lake rich section of Hands Creek, um, and the lakes range in the main channel of Hands to the upland lakes in Upper Hands. Um, our resulting plan was 30 lake day over two helicopter days. Uh, we visited them by helicopter following our sampling plan um, and used the RT rover and post process with Leica software. So what would a field campaign be without a few hiccups? We had issues with the base station with about 12 locations that did not connect to our RTK base and needed to be resampled on a third day and some helicopter issues. Um, so in the end, we collected water surface elevation from 64 lakes with 51 with appropriate accuracy, 43 lakes were surveyed in Hands Creek and eight in Trail Valley Creek. Um, lakes with elevation accuracies of five centimeters left were combined with optical imagery to get lake areas uh, ranging from 0 0.01 meters squared to 4.7 meters squared. Lake elevation with RTK ranged from 38 meters to 169 meters with a mean of 76 and standard deviation of 36. Um, using these baseline elevations, we built a network of 50 lakes to install water level loggers in June of 2022, so next week. <laughs> um, this is our updated sampling plan of the 50 lakes um, to be installed next week. The water level loggers 
will record water surface elevation for summer of 2022 prior to the SWAT launch next fall. Um, timing was based on what we saw for lake ice from the past five years of Sentinel data. Um, and since it's going to be a lot of loggers in a short period of time, we had some pre-built units to get them about five to 10 meters from lake shore. So one last little plug, because it seems like I'm already over time, um, is that we are also looking for students for this project. So if any of this interests you, please reach out. Um, and I'd like to thank all the prior research that has informed our progress to date and to all the contributors that made the research possible. I am sorry for going over time and welcome any questions or suggestions on the next few weeks of putting loggers in lakes. Thank you, Rosie. You are not actually over time. You get oh. <laughs> For worry. some reason, my clock says 18 minutes, so I rushed along. Okay, okay. don't worry. No, all good. Um, we do have time for questions. Okay. Um, please ask your question, raise your hand, or um, put it in the chat for, for Rosie. So um, in your title, uh, Rosie, you mentioned Western Canadian Arctic. I'm just wondering if you're, you know, you're planning to uh, expand it over more area. We're focusing on Trail Valley and Haynes um, Creek, just because we don't really have the resources to really outfoot lakes to get the full water balance beyond that. Um, each one takes about a... Well, the plan is to do 10 lakes per helicopter day um, this next week. So that will add up in time. But there are other groups that are, are part of the CSA that are focusing on other parts of the SWAT mission validation. Okay, awesome. So it's a team teamwork to cover more area then. Yeah. And even though I'm giving this presentation, it is also, I'm a small part of this team, kind of representing other people who I think are, are also on this call. Perfect. Um, great work, Rosie, great work. And thank you very much for the great presentation. Um, I know that you are not feeling well, but you're still doing the presentation. So really appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, we're moving to our uh, last speaker for this session, uh, Jamie Ward. Uh, we'll talk about why do simulated trends of Arctic sea ice drift speed go from positive in the 20th century uh, to negative in 21st century. Jamie, yeah, okay, I'll see you're sharing the screen. That's awesome. The floor okay. is yours. Go ahead, please, Jamie. All right, we'll give it a go. So. Hi, my name is Jamie. Thank you for attending. Let me try this again. There we go. Um, I'm a postdoc at York University working with Dr. Neil Tandon. And our project that we're working on right now is basically to answer this question. Why do simulated trends of Arctic sea ice drift speed go from positive in the 20th century to negative in the 21st century? And just as a little bit of background, Arctic sea ice has been in the news a lot because Arctic sea ice has been thinning and has been retreating since the satellite era began. And it's continuing to do so at a very, very significant rate. As the sea ice continues to thin and retreat, it's moving more quickly in observations. And this is because the thinner sea ice is more deformable. So it can just move around more quickly, crash into other sea ice more quickly, et cetera. Um, and this is just an observations up through this point. And the reason that we care about this is because sea ice is important for a variety of reasons. Sea ice is um, something that actually limits regional warming in the Arctic normally uh, when you know it's all there. Um, and it's also important for Arctic shipping routes. Uh, it obviously can impact shipping efficiency um, when they have to clear out sea ice in front of it. And it also is important for local fauna, flora, and local peoples that live near the sea ice edge. Um, and so even though observations have shown that sea ice speed has increased over the past 40 years or so, um, when we look into the future, and this is a study by Tandon et al. in 2018, 
Um, they use the coupled model, model in, intercomparison project, version five. They use a suite of models and they examined drift speed trends from 1950 through 2100 in the RCP 8.5 scenario. So in other words, the, the greatest warming scenario. And as you can see, especially in September, uh, between 2000 and 2050 or so, um, all of a sudden these increasing sea ice drift speed trends, these curves, switch from positive trends to negative. They decrease rather quickly. We can also see the same thing in March, but obviously to a lesser extent. And this is because sea ice um, extent and thinning and everything like that, these changes are greater in the warmer months when there's more sunlight and the ice albedo effect can, can play its role. Um, so like we're seeing this in both September and in March, the cold season when ice extent is at its greatest. And so with the, with the, um, me, with the rollout of CMIT-6 models, we wanted to answer the following question. How do CMIT-6 September and annual Arctic drift speed trends compare to those of CMIT-5? i.e. looking at, you know, comparing Panda and ELP results to our results. Then we wanted to take it another step and we wanted to say, okay, well, these are the trends that we're seeing. What are the physical mechanisms responsible for these switches, assuming that they occur within the CMIT-6 models? So as I just mentioned, we use CMIT-6 models. These are global climate models that are fully coupled, meaning they have an active ocean, the ice, atmosphere, and land. Um, and they, uh, we used a total of 20 models from institutions around the world. Um, and with these 20 models, we use daily sea ice velocity fields, so meridional and zonal. And the reason that we choose to use daily is because sea ice for speeds vary on scales of five days or so. So like synoptic weather system um, variability type variability with sea ice drift speeds. And monthly averages don't really capture this very well. Um, and what we do is we use those daily velocity fields and we calculate um, sea ice drift speed for the SSP 585 warming scenario. Basically it's the business as usual scenario where every, everything is fossil fuel based and we don't do anything to mitigate what's gonna happen in global climate change if we do the business as usual. Um, yeah, and we calculate this from 1950 through 2100. And here's the results for September. So as you can see from this plot here with all the models included, the, the switch in drift speed trends in September is, it looks pretty similar to what Tandon the L2018 showed. A lot of the models are showing that the um, CS drift speed switches signs between 2000 and 2050. Um, and obviously with all these lines here, it's difficult to disentangle which one is which, but if you see the line right above the legend, that is the kiosk model. And it is the sole model that does not switch over. So if you follow it all the way up, it just keeps going up and up. Conversely, you have the CMCC models, which is the red one right here, and then the dark brick red right underneath. And they actually show no sea ice around 2050. Um, and at first I was kind of confused by the, this variability. And I looked at the present day conditions of sea ice represented in these three models. And all three of them were unrealistic. Kiosk was unrealistically high. Even at the end of the 21st century to September, it was unrealistically high. Um, basically showing not much sea ice concentration change. And uh, the CMCC models, however, were showing much less sea ice concentration than what we would normally see in observations in the Arctic. So for the sake of just making things a little bit more cohesive, we deleted those three models. Um, and I'm not gonna show it here, but the annual drift speed trends, like with TAND and the L 2018, we don't see as much of the switch from positive to negative in the models, but some of the models do exhibit that. I think there's six or seven of them that do. Um, so now that we've looked at the sea ice drift speed trends, we're gonna examine the uh, annual trend, or using the momentum equation, we're gonna see what kind of forces are responsible for these. So the momentum equation, basically on the left-hand side, you're showing the acceleration or the change in velocity of the sea ice. Um, and the components that contribute to this are momentum advection, Coriolis force, 
uh, tilt, which is basically sea surface height change causes sea ice to flow around. It's, it's kind of the equivalent of the pressure gradient force in the atmosphere. Uh, and then you also have to consider wind stress on top of the ice, moving the ice around, ocean stress, and then internal stresses within the ice itself, because it's kind of, it's a, it's considered a fluid in model setup. Now, when we went to do this with the CMIT-6 models, first of all, there were only six out of the 17 remaining models that produced these output fields. And these required fields were only in monthly. Now, since we were using daily sea ice drift speed trends, or excuse me, fields, um, we decided that monthly output may not be sufficient. We will be exploring this further in the future, but I'll, I digress. Um, so instead, we wanted to look at daily forces. And since CMIP 6 models do not include this, we decided to use a CESM 2 large ensemble model run because this ESM2 large ensemble produces daily output of these fields. Uh, for the purpose of this presentation, we only analyzed one ensemble member. And when we were analyzing this ensemble member two, uh, something to keep in mind as I continue forward, the, there is an assumption with the momentum equation referred to as the steady state assumption. And this is basically stating that, okay, the drift velocity is not accelerating. So dv dt is zero. And then when you do that, and we are able to neglect advection as well, the momentum advection term, because it is much, much smaller than the other terms. Um, and then you look at each component of the vector equation, you get these two equations here, which are just basically components. The first term looks at the sea surface tilt force. The second term is the wind stress, the third term ocean stress, and the final term is the internal stress. And so we have all this set up, we're getting ready to go, but first we wanted to make sure that indeed the CESM2 large ensemble run does produce a drift speed trend switch. Um, unlike the CMIP6 models, uh, CESM2 lens does an SSP370 scenario, which is warming, not quite as much, but also it's not an ideal situation because in this socio socioeconomic pathway, uh, basically, Global trade will be reduced, but there's still going to be the same sort of activities going on within nations themselves. So there's going to be less, less sharing of resources between nations, but not much improvement with adaptation or mitigation. As you can see from the annual drift speed, um, around 2037, I think, is the year, um, it switches from positive drift speed trends to negative drift speed trends. So we have the switch. Let's take a look at the momentum balance and see what we can find. OK, so there's a bunch of components here. For the sake of brevity, I'm only looking at the zonal trends, so the zonal drift velocity trends. Um, before we get started with this, I do want to mention that I did get the momentum equation to balance using the steady state assumption. So the top row shows the sum of all these forces on the right-hand side of the momentum equation. And the, um, the drift or the uh, time derivative of the zonal drift, those patterns look very similar to this top row. So as you can see here, we have the top row showing the sum of all the forces. Then individually, we have the tilt force in the second row, um, the atmosphere plus the ocean stress in the third row, and then internal stress in the bottom row. The reason that we combine the atmosphere and the ocean stress in the third row is because when we look at each component individually, um, the atmosphere and ocean stress patterns were approximately opposite. So we wanted to combine them to sort of see what their combined influence was. Um, and the columns represent different year chunks. So the all years is the entire time span that we're looking at. The increasing years is when we actually see increasing drift speed. So this is from 1950 through uh, 2037. And the decreasing years is from 2037 onward to the end of the time series. So as you can see here, if you look at the first two rows, oops, that was my bad, um, and you compare the sum of all the components with the tilt, they're pretty similar looking patterns. Um, we can see here too, if we compare just between the all years increasing speed and decreasing speed years too, the patterns are very different. Um, and these are all on the same scale too. So just the, the coloring is relative between each of the three and in the individual row. 
excuse me. So this is the first thing that jumped out to us, that the tilt seemed to be playing a big role with the sum of all the, <clears throat> the component forces. Then we looked at the bottom two rows, so the combined atmosphere ocean stress and the internal stresses. And as you can see, especially looking at the outside column, um, you can see the patterns are pretty similar, but they're opposite. Um, and so we thought maybe since these are roughly opposite, it's basically all these, the internal stress, the atmosphere winds and the ocean are sort of all combining to basically cancel out the tilt is the main player here. You can sort of think of the atmosphere, ocean and internal stress is like a spring, a spring like internal force is a spring reacting after an external force pushed on it. <clears throat> so we wanted to see whether or not these internal stresses were indeed counteracting the atmosphere and ocean stress. So we added them together. And now we have a plot showing, this is again, just for zonal drift speeds. This is the sum of all the forces in the zonal direction, uh, tilt trend by itself, and then the remaining three added together. So again, what uh, the thing that jumps out to me most is that the first two rows look very similar to one another. Um, you can also see too that the combined forces of the atmosphere, ocean, and internal stress, they are smaller, the shading is, a little bit lighter, but they're not like an order of magnitude smaller. So they're still playing a role in the changes in drift speed in the zonal direction. Um, I don't show the meridional version here, but we get the same results in the meridional direction. In other words, the, the sum of the trend is similar to the tilt term um, and also the fact that the atmosphere plus ocean plus internal stresses don't quite cancel out. So overall, what we find is that the CMIP-6 models reproduce what we see with the CMIP-5 models in that there's the positive to negative drift speed trend switch. Um, we find the daily derived momentum equation variables in the ESN2 LE, the large ensemble, indicate that sea surface tilt is the leading cause of the switch. But we still need to disentangle this just a little bit further. So things that we're gonna work on in the near future include looking at the momentum balance for summer sea ice drift speeds, because we are looking at annual here. Um, with the signal of the switch being larger in the summer, it would be interesting to see how that compares. Um, we also wanna answer the question, do the tilt forces contribute to observed sea ice drift speed changes? Or is this just something that's happening in the model? And finally, what is responsible for these sea surface height gradient changes that are causing these changes in the tilt? All right, thank you very much. I would like to thank Neil for his help with this project. Um, and I would thank you very much for coming and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jamie. So we have time for one quick question because we are running out of the time. Uh, Frederick, I see your hands up. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. The, um, uh, yeah, I, I guess, but the tilt change, uh, it sounds like uh, it must be the buffer gyro high that, uh, that, that is producing most of the tilt uh, must be changing over time. So probably uh, decreasing in amplitude, is that possible? Oh, it's definitely possible, yeah. Um, I, I def well, we're gonna dig further into the exact mechanisms of this, but I can see that being the case. Um, that was the buffer high was something that definitely jumped out when we were first looking at these results. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, everyone. Uh, although we don't have time right now because next session is starting in five minutes, we have extra 15 minutes in the next session that we can get back to our presenter and have the discussion and you can ask the question related to any speakers of today uh, session. So, um, yeah, with that, I will close the session. Thank you, speakers and uh, audience for your questions and great presentations. See you all at, in five minutes. Oh, actually, no, at 4.55. Sorry, my bad. So see you all at 4.55 Eastern time. So thank you. See you. <laughs>